Amen. Well, please turn now with me to Isaiah 65 uh, for our penultimate sermon uh, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, a, a woeful day, at least for me, uh, if, if not for you. We are coming to the end uh, of a long journey through this, uh, through this book as we come to chapter 65, which we'll look at this morning, and then 66, which we'll look at, Lord willing, next week. So Isaiah chapter, chapter 65, reading from verse 1. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, to a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay, I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord, because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will measure into their laps payment for their former deeds." Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servant shall dwell there. Sharon shall become a pasture for flocks in the valley of Acre, a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me. But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, who fill cups of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you to the sword. And all you who shall bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen, but you did what was evil in my eyes and chose what I did not delight in. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my servant shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. Behold, my servant shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart and shall wail for breaking of spirit. You shall leave your name to my chosen for a curse, and the Lord God will put you to death, but his servants he will call by another name, so that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and shall be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner shall a hundred years old be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for a calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox." The dust shall be my serpents, shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Let us pray. 
O Lord our God, we pray now that you would come and help us as we read and study your word together. We pray that you would open it to it to us and apply it to our hearts, that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we might properly read it and mark it and learn it and inwardly digest it. Amen. Well, the words of Isaiah have ended. With the prayer that Isaiah gave us in the previous chapter, his ministry now is complete. Isaiah has led us on an incredible journey, and he has laid, laid out for us in incredible ways the lavish and bountiful grace of God for sinners. Throughout this book, Isaiah has laid out for us the depths of our sin as we have looked at the Judeans and seen, just as the first seven verses describe here, the hardness of the sinful heart, and even when grace is that even when grace is put on manifest display, yet we are prone to rebel against that grace and against the goodness of God. We are prone even to reject the worship of the true and living God, and in its place, worship gods of our own imaginations, God who do not, gods who do not condemn our sin, gods who do not atone for our sin, but gods who instead indulge our sin. It was the tragedy of the first half of Isaiah, seeing the people of Judah, seeing the people of Jerusalem, having all of the blessings and the benefits of the covenant, having the ceremonial law that led them to see the magnificence of God and the mercies of God in accepting a substitute on their behalf. Here they were, the people of Jerusalem, the temple front and center, the center point of the architecture of the holy capital, that great monument to the grace and glory of God, God here dwelling in their midst, yet cut off from them because of their sin, dwelling in that holy of holies behind the curtains, but yet accepting the substitute sacrifices providing priests, providing the high priest who symbolically carried the priest, sent the people into that holy place before the throne of God. It was all the declaration of good news that while God was high and exalted, as Isaiah saw so vividly in chapter 6, not just holy, but holy, 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 perfect in His holiness, so perfect and radiant that not even the sinless angels could look upon Him. Even still, this holy God, so full of mercy and grace, that He provided the way for sinners to be reconciled to Him. The ceremonial law, the temple, all proclaiming the good news. As one man put it, that while God was in no way responsible was in no way at fault for sin's entry into the world. Yet God willingly bearing responsibility for it and making the way for sinners to be reconciled to Him. But the tragedy, of course, as we have seen all the way throughout this book, that the desires of the flesh and the promises of the world coming so alluring, so enamoring, so blinding, that we are prone to reject such a wonderful gospel. The story of Isaiah's life, the story of a man preaching to the wind, the story of a man proclaiming to recalcitrant sinners that still there was grace to be found in God for them, warning of the judgment of God that was sure to come against sinners, but yet inviting them to heed the warning and turn from their sin and lay hold of God. There's a warning here in verse 11 that for those who forsake the Lord and who forget His holy mountain, who, who forget the temple mount, who devote themselves to false gods, the warning, a dreadful fate awaits. But yet the promise, verse 10, that for those who seek the Lord while He may be found, a bountiful future lies before them. That's been the theme of Isaiah's ministry, even the theme of his post-mortem ministry that we have seen in, from the beginning of chapter 40. Isaiah, a preacher destined to preach into the wind, 
a preacher destined to preach, but yet no one to listen to a word that he said, but yet a man of a persistent, tender heart, not growing bitter or cynical against the people he preached to, but a man of such tender heart that he was not willing to let his people go and even write this letter that his gospel might go to the generations yet to come. What was it that Paul wrote in Romans 9.3? As he considered the fate of his kinsmen, he wrote, he wrote, I could wish that I myself were cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. As Paul looks at, at his kinsmen according to the flesh, as he looked at the Jews, the Jews who were now as against him as he had once been against the church, his heart not hardened to them, but only his prayer saying, oh, if it were possible that I would be accursed that they might be saved. Right, we've seen, haven't we, that there is something, a lot of that in Isaiah. A man of such tender heart that he, having been wholly rejected in his own lifetime, sits and writes this letter that we find from the beginning of chapter 40, writes this gospel out for the grandchildren, for the great-grandchildren of the people who have rejected him, that they might take them, take this gospel even into exile, that they might pick up and read the good news, that even for them, recalcitrant generational sinners, yet there is grace and mercy to be found in God. Isaiah not willing to let his people go. His love for his people such that he writes this letter, and from beyond the grave reaches through history and exhorts them to forsake their sin and return to God in faith and repentance. And gloriously, as we've seen, Isaiah, only by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, has anticipated that finally the gospel he preaches will land on fertile ground. He wouldn't see it in his own day. That was the commission God had given him in Isaiah 6 that he was to go and preach to a people who would reject him, and their hearts would be hardened to everything he said. But yet, oh, what a mercy of God to Isaiah, that by the Spirit he knew that, that in a generation yet to come, the gospel he preached would be believed, that a day would come when, when the good news he preaches would be heard, and, and those great-grandchildren of his contemporaries, would, they would repent and they would say, be saved. Now, they would come woefully after they had been sent into exile, sorrowfully. They would have to hit rock bottom before they would hear this gospel call. They would have to be, a point, be brought to a point where they would have seen every one of their idols fall and fail, and, and they would be brought to a point of having nothing left. But then the gospel would come. And they would hear the good news that even for them there was grace and mercy to be found in God. And gloriously, Isaiah has written this letter to, to not only lead them to Christ, but then to lead them on as the people of God, to show them what the life they are called to live looks like, to, to show them what it means for their whole identities and self-conception now to be wrapped up in the promise of that future world that we have seen Isaiah describe in the last few chapters. And Isaiah has led his readers to see the fullness of the salvation that we receive in Christ. He has led his readers to see that, that in and through Christ, the, the deepest longings of our hearts will be secured that we will be brought up and out of this present world, and we'll be brought into that new Jerusalem, that new creation. We will be brought out of the troubles and cares and concerns of this fallen world, and we will be brought into a new creation at peace with God, simply enjoying His complete and total victory over all of His and our enemies. And the point, you remember, as we've been seeing, the point that Isaiah wants his, his readers to grasp and take away, is that as those who have laid hold of the benefits and blessings of Jesus Christ, as those who have been given this great hope of this new world, they are to live 
and move as the people of that new creation in this present world. That's what we've seen over the past few weeks, isn't it? You remember what, what Spurgeon said in that table address that has become so famous. He said, oh, oh, that the cross were painted on my eyeballs, that I would see nothing but by the medium of my Savior's passion. We could paraphrase it and say that what Isaiah has been driving into the hearts of his readers over the past few chapters is, is, oh, that the hope of the new world would be painted on our eyeballs that we might not see anything but by the medium of that future hope. It's Peter's exhortation that we would see ourselves as sojourners in this present world, citizens of a new heavenly kingdom passing through this present world as pilgrims. And it all led, as we saw last week, to Isaiah's closing prayer. His closing prayer leading us to pray that this kingdom would come, that this new reality would come into existence and we would be brought into that place of peace and rest. That prayer that imitated and filled out John's prayer at the end of Revelation, come Lord Jesus. That prayer that anticipates the Lord's prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Isaiah has led us to pray. Lord, haste the day when our faith would be sight and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. And that last word from Isaiah, that like John at the end of Revelation, ending on that prayer for the consummation of the ages and the restoration of the world and the peace of God's people. It's the last thing we'll hear from Isaiah. His words are ended. His ministry is complete. And now in these last two chapters of the book, we hear not from Isaiah the messenger, but we hear from God the King. And what is it that God says to us here? It is essentially that everything that Isaiah has told us is true. Now, not that there's any doubt, right? Our doctrine of Scripture teaches us that all of God's Word is all God's Word, right? Tim 2 Timothy 3.16, we know it well. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Right? We know, as good Presbyterians, that there are not some parts of Scripture more authoritative than others, that all of it is the Word of God, all of it is the Word of Christ, all of it has come from heaven for our blessing and our benefit. We know that the words that Isaiah has written to us is the very Word of God come through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But here, Grasp the picture, right? So much of these closing chapters, really so much of everything that Isaiah has written is, is, is poetic in its, in its imagery and in its force. So, so don't get tripped up here too much. But the idea is that Isaiah the messenger has completed his ministry. He's told us of the manifold grace of God for sinners. He's depicted that great hope of the new world for us. He's led us in prayer. The, the herald has done his work. And the image is that that herald now steps to one side and, and almost from behind him, out now comes the king himself to stand on the wall and to directly address his people. And what does he say to us in these last two chapters? He says to us, listen, people of God, Everything that Isaiah says, the gospel that Isaiah has been preaching, it is trustworthy and true. It's the reassurance that 
that Isaiah has not been caught up in flights of fancy. The reassurance that Isaiah has been faithful and he has borne faithful witness to the heart of God for sinners. And you understand these two chapters, these two words from the king, this too is, is grace. One of the things that we've noted throughout the book of Isaiah this book, as we've noted several times, but it's, it's so good. Write it in your Bibles. The early church called this book the, the fifth gospel. It is so dripping with the grace and mercy of God specifically and explicitly in and through Jesus Christ that it might as well be bound up with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But one of the things that we have noted all the way through this book, the richness, the fullness of the gospel that Isaiah has described, it can seem too good to be true, especially when we grasp the depths of our sins. Right? When we think of ourselves pretty highly, it doesn't take a lot for us to believe that God loves us. And if we minimize our sins and excuse it away, we begin to think that we actually deserve the love of God. Right? We know it anecdotally, maybe experientially, those infamous diagnostic questions, if you were to die today, why would God let you into heaven? What is the most common answer to that question? Well, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. I've murdered anybody. I haven't stolen anything. I've been faithful to my wife. I'm pretty good. When you think you're pretty good, you, you don't think that it takes a lot for God to love you. Of course He'll love me. Of course He'll let me into heaven. I'm a, I'm a good person. Right? It's the prayer of the Pharisee in Luke 18, isn't it? What did he do? He stood in the temple and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other, other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. It's fascinating, isn't it? That actually is not a bad prayer. Right? It's, it's good to give thanks to God that we have been kept from gross sins. It's really a prayer that's not a million miles away from a prayer that has been held up as exemplary for hundreds of years. That, that statement of John Bradford sitting in jail, you, you know it. John Bradford's in prison for preaching the gospel, and he sits in his jail, and he looks out the bars of his window, and he sees a man going to be executed for murder. And what does John Bradford say? There the, by, the but by the grace of God goes John Bradford. John Bradford knew that were it not for the saving grace of God, he would be the one executed for murder and not the Puritan imprisoned for the sake of Christ. He gave thanks to God that he was not like other men, but that by the grace of God he had been kept from gross sin. So what was so bad about the Pharisees' prayer? So bad that Jesus says that that man left the temple and went to his house unjustified. It was, as Jesus went on to say, that that man uttered that prayer exalting himself. His prayer to God, a pious disguise for his own pride for his belief that, that he wasn't actually that bad, and that in a sense he deserved to be found in the temple. But when we minimize our sin in our hearts, we can even use the right words, but use them to disguise the underlying belief that I actually don't think that I'm that bad, and I don't actually think it takes that much for God to love me. But when we go on to grasp the depths of our sin, when we are led by the Holy Spirit to see just how sinned blackened our hearts are, how truly twisted and corrupted we have become in our sin, then we become like the tax collector in Luke 18. Right? What was his prayer? That tax collector standing far off, not even able to lift his eyes up to heaven, beating his breast, 
praying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But when we grasp just how deep our sin runs, when we grasp our propensity to idolatry and self-exaltation, when we grasp our propensity, as God describes it here in verse 5, keep yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy to you, too, uh, too holy for you. What is that? That's a, that's a, I am a better than you statement. When we grasp just how, how proud our sins have made us, believing that we can manipulate God, believing that we can come to God on our terms, not His, believing that we can rewrite His law to make it more palatable to us, believing that we have the right to try then to conform other people to our wills, when we grasp just how grotesque our sin has made us, twisting our wants and desires and our loves and our praises in on ourselves to the neglect of God and to the cost to our neighbor, especially when we, when we grasp that in light of the servant songs that Isaiah has given us, right, on the one hand, these wonderful assurances that a Savior will come and rescue us, but on the other hand, a dreadful condemnation of our sin, that our sin is so bad that it can only be forgiven if another comes and stands in our place as our substitute before the law of God. Our sin is so bad, we would come to see in the New Testament that it could only be atoned for in reality if that substitute is the Son of God. When we see that, when we see just how, how sin blackened and and degraded we are in our sin, then we stand like that tax collector broken before God. And we can struggle even to look up to heaven, and we can struggle to believe that God could actually love a sinner like me. And so, what we have in these last two verses, after Isaiah has, has led us to see the, the absolute wretched depths of our sin, and as He has led us to see the the heights of God's love for wretched sinners in Jesus Christ, in His, in His mercy, having heard this glorious gospel, the King Himself comes out and He says to us, it is all true, you know. It's all true. Everything that Isaiah has, has said to you, it's, it's true. He says to you, beloved, you are as bad as Isaiah has told you. He's not just dour and Presbyterian. He's not just caught up in a northern European obsession with gritty bleakness. You are as twisted and corrupted as He has said you are. And it does mean that a terrible judgment awaits you if you do not repent. Right? That's what the first half of this chapter is saying. God just adding His amen to everything that Isaiah has said. It is all true. Isaiah has not just been trying to scare you straight. The solemn truth, verses 6 and 7 is that God will not keep silent, and a day of reckoning will come, and He will indeed repay in the bosom of those who have rebelled against Him their iniquities, and there will, verse 12, solemnly be a slaughter of the wicked. God comes out, and He says, it's all true. But Isaiah has been saying, it's, it's true. My, my holiness requires it. My justice requires it. My goodness requires it. Evil cannot remain unpunished. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I, I will repay. A day is coming when all of these things will come to bear on the earth. But God assures us, everything Isaiah has told you, about grace and mercy, that all is true as well. God says to us, there is mercy to be found. Verse 10, for those who have, who have sought Him, He says, There's a, there is indeed a verdant world that awaits, and it will be every bit as glorious as Isaiah has just said. For those who come and, and cast themselves upon my mercy and grace, He says, it's true. It's true. This new world, this new Jerusalem is is 
is coming, and, and it will be every bit as glorious as Isaiah has told you. And, and he adds even more, actually. Right, look at what he says in verse 11, verse, uh, in verse 17, and in the verses that follow. This is a, a poem. We call it a poem to the new world. And, and notice how it, how it begins, this, this underlying setting for, for us grasping the blessings of peace and wholeness. God says, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Do you remember how God described His own recollection of our sin in the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 34? What is it? You, you should know we, we, we gloriously pray it all the time. God says, I will, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember it no more. Right, that remember there being the Hebraic remember, not so much a remember in the sense of recall to mind, but, but in the sense of remember as in, as in call to mind with respect to action. Right, remember, remember, that is how remember is used all the way through the Old Testament. Right, I can remember that my car keys are in my study and do nothing more about it. But to the Hebrew mind, for me to remember that my car keys are in my study is for me to leave this pulpit and go and get them. The, the notion of remembering is a call to action. And so in, I, in Jeremiah 31, 34, God says, I, I, I know your sin, but, but I, there will be no judgment. All consequent judgment will be put away. No, no rising against the people to be to be feared. Colossians 2.14, the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands now, now cancelled and, and, and set aside. Right? It's not promising divine amnesia. It's, it's simply promising that, that God will not, will not come against us in our sin anymore. But now God promises here that we too will be brought into that not remembering. Now, again, it's, it's not saying that we won't know that we have sinned. But it is rather that there will now be no hostility on the basis of sin and no guilt on the basis of our sin. That simply in that new world, there will simply be joy in the redeeming work of Christ who is able to save wretches like us. It's the tweet we referenced a few weeks ago, isn't it? That glorious thought that as Paul entered heaven, he did so to the cheers of those he had martyred. All thoughts turn to the magnificent glories of Christ. No resentment on the part of the martyrs. No crushing guilt on the part of the apostles but all of heaven erupting into a thunderous praise at the Christ who could save even a violent hater of the church and so change his heart, so wholly subdue him and regenerate him that he became an apostle of Christ and an evangelist of the gospel he once despised. Right, that's the thought in verse 17, right? Not a, not a forgetfulness as if when we enter into that new earth and that new heavens that, that we simply forget our, our former lives, but a freedom from guilt, a freedom from resentment so that our memory of sin just now resounds to the praise of Christ for His salvation, a freedom to simply delight in the saving work of God, and, and in that heavens, evil once again becoming the handmaiden of God, and being turned only into a glorious reason for His greater praise. All right, that's it in verse 18, isn't it? How does God describe the new Jerusalem? How does He describe the church in the new age? How does He describe the people of God collectively? A place of unrestrained joy and gladness. To such an extent that the people of God here are described as simply being a gladness. Right? The people of God in that new world delight embodied 
Right? Verse 19, in that new world, God says there will be no more weeping, no more distress. Right? One man put it like this, an English minister, I think this is so good. He says, at some point, somewhere, someone will shed the last tear ever. And then the old order of things will have passed away. Isn't that great? A beautiful thought. There will be someone, somewhere, at some time, will shed the last tear ever to fall, forevermore. And there will just be joy and praise and glory and peace and rest and, and happiness. And God says, that's it. That's the world I'm making. It's, it's every bit as glorious as Isaiah told you, more so even. Look at verse 20, how he fills this out for us. How wonderful. He says, he takes probably the, the worst experience we could go through. He says there will be no more infant mortality. No parent will ever face that searing pain of the death of a, a baby. But then on the other end of the spectrum, he says, listen, there will be no degeneration to the grave anymore either. No more getting older, knowing that one step is one step closer to the grave. Just life forevermore. Now, don't get tripped up on the imagery, right? This is poetic imagery that's being used here. It's not that death will remain that would contradict verses 18 and 19, but, but rather the image of the, the whole, the, the power of death gone from the whole of life. That's, that's the image that's being cast for us here. Young and old, no more that shadow of death hanging over, but all of the, the bitterness of this world, the, 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 the fear of death gone. Right? Carl Truman put it particularly starkly once when he said, we have to realize that no one has ever saved a life. As grateful as we are for, for doctors and the, the medical professions and first responders, we have to come to terms with the reality that nobody has ever saved a life. They have only delayed death. And I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for their death-delaying work. But it's, it's frightening. It's frightening that that, that that shadow hangs over us all the time, but God says no more, not in the new world. It'll all be gone from young and old, right? It's the image of permanence that we find in verses 21 and 22 that just gives us these further poetic hooks on which to hang this hope. Right? They shall build houses and plant and enjoy the fruit of their labors forevermore. Right? No longer chapter 40's withering grass and fading flower. That image there used to depict the impermanence of human society. But now humanity depicted as a tree strong and steadfast. No longer here today and gone tomorrow, but rather enjoying the work of their hands, watching the passing of the ages like ancient oaks. It's a world so peaceful, so at harmony, so free from the hostilities of this present age that even, verse 25, natural predators find their natures changed and the predator and the prey dwell in tranquility. And it's all true, the king tells us. Verse 13, while the wicked shall be destitute, a future of want and fear and suffering before them, hungry, thirsty, ashamed, broken in heart and spirit, cursed by God, for those who have sought the Lord, there shall be eating and drinking and rejoicing and singing. Their hearts will be glad and they will be blessed by the Lord forevermore. It's a glorious future. And the word that Isaiah has been saying to us all the way along and the word that the Lord repeats to us here is the good news that anyone can get in on it. Right? If you have not yet put your faith in Christ, then listen to what this chapter is saying. Hear God as He confirms Isaiah's testimony that you are indeed worse than you ever dared imagine. But hear God as He confirms Isaiah's testimony that there is a glorious future with God on offer to you, the deepest desires of your heart to enter into a world free from evil and injustice, a world free from want and suffering, from fear and death. It is there for you. It is on offer, and it is just there for the taking. All you have to do is come to God in Christ. It's Romans 6.23, the wages of your sin is death, but in Christ Jesus eternal life is to be found. 
It is as one church's mantra says, I am an idiot, but I have a glorious future, and everyone can get in on this. In Christ Jesus, eternal life is to be found. So give up your idolatry, turn from your pride and self-reliance, admit your weakness, see your sin, run to Jesus, put your faith in Him, and you will be made a citizen of heaven. And listen, if you've done it, if you are a Christian, hear this warning, hear this word, this word as you pass through your pilgrimage through this present world, this heavenly city awaits. And you've heard it not just from the messenger, but you've heard it from the king himself. The road will be hard, and sorrows will abound, but you are destined for this new world. Isaiah has told you of it. God himself confirms it, and so press on, dear Christian, and rejoice in Christ, and rejoice in his bountiful salvation, even for a wretch like you. Let us pray.